Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. Everybody. Welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm your host, Mark Fusco, here for another episode of the show. And uh, so we're going to do uh, something a little different. Not different. I don't know why I said that. I just didn't know what to say next. <laughs> and we're not going to restart. I had to restart a couple times because I didn't have the microphone set and I didn't have this, that, and the other. So anyway. Um, all right, so we're not going to do anything necessarily different. Well, this is kind of different, okay? So yeah. We're going to do a, um, a wine here that has an unusual... Um, uh, blend. So, and that's why I really bought this wine, besides that the name sounded kind of cool. So, let's get right into it. This is the non vintage Thistle Do, or This Will Do, uh, Cabernet Sauvignon Petit Verdot blend. Um, got it at World Market for $6.99. It's a 65% cab and a 35% Petit Verdot. Now, this is one of those wines that. Um, after doing research, can't really find too much about it. The uh, the importer, Prestige Wine Group, um, doesn't have it on its website anymore. And looking up all the other stuff on uh, online, you go into like you know Wine Searcher or um, Snooth or any of those other ones, uh, doesn't really have much to it. So it's kind of like, well, I have a feeling that that they they produce some wine that this particular estate, which is the uh, Armadale Estate, Armadale Estate Wines, probably produced some wine for a few years and then for whatever reason they don't produce wines either under that name anymore or they're just growers and they sell their grapes off. But um, most of the stuff was non-vintage. I did find a couple vintages, older vintages, like 2000, I think three and 2005, something like that. Anyway, but uh, apparently they don't, either they're not around anymore or they don't import or whatever. So. Let's check it out. It was $6.99 at World Market, so I thought that might be kind of a cool price point to uh, hit. And uh, Cab Petit Verdot is not something that I normally see as far as a blend. Oh, from Australia. I forgot to say where it was from. Uh, just as Australia, um, though I think the actual winery is in the southeastern part of Australia. Uh, south, well, it just says South Australia, so not Southeast. Okay, so let's check it out. And the microphone, I think, is a little bit too close on the nose I get red fruits just kind of generic I get a bit of a burn alcohol burn but it's really not that ha it's only 13 and a half so it's not really really high in alcohol you know, some wood, some some wood aromas. But really nothing that stands out. You know, just kind of some generic red fruit and wood. I see how it tastes. All right, so on the palate, I get a little bit of hint of chocolate. Um, still more of the generic red fruit, maybe not necessarily cherry, but you get kind of that generic red, darker red fruit. Um, tannins are pretty light. Uh, I don't really feel that they're they're very heavy tannins. I'd probably call them about a medium tannin. Um, and then uh, a decent acidity though. I mean, mouth is really watering. Finish isn't too bad. I still can kind of taste the wine. Um, but I still get really just that, you know, some red fruit, maybe the chocolate's kind of gone. Get a little bit of the wood. I don't get too much of the wood, but uh, what we're saying, the aroma, I could really smell the wood. I can't really taste wood, but there's wood influence on, on the wine, obviously. Um, it's not bad.
Yeah, and I can taste a little more wood now. I think I was in this, that initial chocolate flavor. I mean, it's it's a decent wine. It's tasty. Um, I don't really think it, it doesn't feel like it's really um, very distinctive. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily I mean, especially since I'm not have a lot of experience in drinking this type of blend from Australia, I wouldn't sit there and go, oh, this is definitely Australia. I can tell you it doesn't taste very ex extracted. You know, we're, we're kind of used to Australian wines in general having that big extracted flavor to it. Um, so it doesn't really taste very jammy, doesn't very, you know, doesn't doesn't have a lot of, a lot of that quote stereotypical Australian punch to it. But um, at the same time, I, I, I would say this could be a wine from from most anywhere in the new world. With all that said, it's still pretty tasty. I like it. I saw some reviews that gave it really bad reviews. I mean, I think it's a a decently made wine. Uh, I don't think it's anything uh, to turn your nose up on. And it's seven dollars. It's reasonably priced. You know, you're, it's probably only available at World Market. You probably can't find it anywhere else. So they probably got a great deal on it and bought bought up the uh, bought up the supply for the United States and. They're selling it for a decent price. I'd give it an 85. I mean, it's it's decently made. It, de it tastes pretty decent, um, and it's it's nothing nothing bad about the wine. It's you know I like it. I wouldn't I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't hesitate buying it again if I was going to buy another other uh, bottle of wine. Uh, it's just you know just like a lot of wine. I'm, I keep feeling the the microphone. I'm kind of worried that even though I know the level is good, kind of worried about it keeps hitting me in the uh, the chin here, the neck, but uh, um, you know, just like a lot of these wines, these are I wouldn't say generic, but they're they're wines that were made for a little while. Uh, for whatever the reason, they stopped making them. Um, you know, may, maybe because it wasn't uh, they didn't sell a lot of it, they stopped making it. Who knows? I, I would like to know what happened, but you know, it's one of those things where this wine could be three or four years old, and the and the uh, the company may have folded up, or like I said, they may be just, they're just growers now. But it's pretty good. I'd buy it again. Why not? So, um, there's going to be a short segment. First segment, that's fine, because the last segment's going to be pretty long. All right. So, um, if you find it in World Market, buy it. I like it. It tastes pretty decent. Let's go ahead and move on to the next wine. All right, so now we're back with the next wine here. Um, this is another wine that I bought from Ceci Bretto from uh, Venusly Speak, Venusly Speaking, Venusly Speaking, uh, a fine wine shop. Um, anyway, I always say Venusly, and it's not, it's Venusly. Uh, anyway, um, let's get the clock started there. So, um, like I said in the last episode, I contacted her about uh, getting some wines uh, on 4th of July, and this was the other wine that we got. Um, this is the, uh, and, and I bought it because, well, it, it kind of looked kind of cool, and uh, I need some more exposure to South African wine, so I went ahead and got it. So uh, this is the 2000, well, the Signatures of Dulhof 2005 Merlot. Um, this was, uh, it's regularly priced, priced at $32, and uh, this is from um, the, well, Dulhof, Dulhof is in the Wellington part of South Africa. Uh, it is a valley surrounded by three mountains, and Dulhof is the mo northernmost winery in that area. They're, they're at the end of the road, not the end of the road, they're at the, actually the, the part where they, back in the, I think the 1700s some point, late 1700s, I'll have to take a look at the history real quick here, um, bam, they created a gap, or they created a pass, 1840s, there we go, so um, Andrew Geddes Bain built the Bain's Kloof pass um, because there really was no access to the rest of uh, well the northern part of South Africa um, in from that valley at least nothing easy so they uh, he created this pass and they're at the northern end of that pass now there's been grapes growing in the area since the middle to middle late 1700s yeah well the early 1700s um, the actual estate didn't actually get started until 1995 um, 
and the, uh, well, sorry, 1993. First vines were planted in 95, and the current owners bought it in 2003. Uh, 2005, the vintage of this, um, the farm was given estate status. Now, um, this, this particular bottle was imported, or this, the, this was imported by um, Emerging South uh, Company, but they may have another importer because um, it looked like they only imported the 2005 Merlot and I think the 2005 Cab. So outside of that, did I start the microphone? Am I recording? Yes, I am. Woo! My little whoop, zoom. I mean, not that it would have been horrible, but you never know. Anyway, um, so it looks like the, that company only only imported the, 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 this one vintage, and then they probably have some other importer right now. All right, so um, let's go ahead and get into it. Uh, I believe it's 100% Merlot. If uh, I was trying to find uh, information on, on that, and I thought I had the still. Maybe I didn't. Okay, anyway... Um, if I remember right, it was 100% Merlot, maybe even say in the back. But when I was looking it up and went to the Emerging South uh, thing, uh, it looked like it said 100% Merlot. All right, so let's check it out. All right, chocolate and chocolate and more chocolate. Um, lots of chocolate, almost a bit of caramel to it, a um, bit of earthiness. Kind of a, a sweetness to it. Maybe a little bit of pepper, like a sweetness, almost like a sweet pepper, I guess. Interesting nose. All right, so let's check it out. Hmm. It's pretty, it's kind of tasty. Um, It honestly has, um, it honestly has this almost marinara sauce or, yeah, quality to it. But I, I taste the, I taste the fruit. It tastes really nice red fruit, a little bit sweet. I'm tasting, uh, um, some chocolate. Not much of the caramel still, but I get a little bit of that. Um, some vanilla. So I feel like, you know, it, it probably used American oak, at least somewhat American oak, but I thought they also used French oak. That might have been, I thought they used some French oak. But I do get some, I do get some type of spices to it. It's really interesting. Tannins aren't, aren't really over the top. Uh, they're very medium, almost medium minus. I get a bit of greenness to it too. It's interesting, um, almost like gaminess. Um, like I, I can smell like, like being around like wild wild game, or like you're at a at a zoo, or like a um, um, what you call it, an, an African preserve or whatever. You kind of the kind of not. not and it's not like a, a really bad animal smell, but it's almost like you can smell their their fur. Um, kind of like kind of that type of taste. I've never had something like that exactly. Like maybe it's probably the leather. Maybe maybe there's a leather component to it, and I, I feel like it's like a hide. So like you know, an animal that's been skinned, you're you're kind of smelling that or tasting that type of having that type of taste. It's like being like in a hunter's lodge. Okay. 
that's probably what I'm getting more than anything else. Interesting. I like it a whole lot. Um, I think mainly for the interesting factor than anything else, but um, I think it's pretty decent. Uh, I'm going to give it a score of 88. Now, with that said, I'm not entirely sure that this wine is supposed to taste like that. It's probably hard for you to see, but on the sides of the cork, and we're going to be, and this is actually kind of I'm like cool, but very timely, we're going to be talking about the next set of things called wine faults. That's what the Wine 101 this week, this week is. And now I have an example of something um, about corks, and, and we'll talk about that more in depth. But um, there's definitely some, some wine that's crawled up the cork, some staining, um, that's typically a sign of heat damage. However, this, this wine really doesn't taste oxidized which is what can potentially happen. Not that the heat itself is changed the wine, but what it can do is it can, it can alter the cork and allow more air in, which can oxidize it. Um, the cork was perfectly flush. It wasn't pushed out, um, so there wasn't anything like that. Um, and it could just be that it had been stored outside for a very long time. I mean, that's a 2005. Um, I'm not sure how long this wine has actually been in the shop. Sessie did inherit the shop, and here she bought the shop. I don't know how long that this particular wine's been in the shop. I'm not saying that her her shop is is too hot. It's not. It's it's at least when I've been in there since she's bought it, there's been nothing wrong with the temperature in the shop. And I would I would know that and I know her personally is she wouldn't buy a shop that had issues with temperature control. She visited the shop numerous times, so there could have been something with the uh, distributor. Um, who knows? But uh, or just could just the cork itself may not have had a completely perfect seal. Um, but anyway, it tastes good. So that's what I say. With that, all that said, it tastes good. It may taste a little bit different than, than it's supposed to. But you know, a little bit of oxygen is going to is going to influence the wine anyway. That's how wine ages. Is especially like in in the oak barrels. We remember the micro oxygenation oxygen oxygenation. Uh, Micro oxygenation, oxygenate, whatever, whatever the thing, the little bit of oxygen in there. I can't speak now. But uh, when it's in barrel, that happens. Um, and then over time, a little bit of oxygen is going to get through the cork. All right, so it will age wine a little bit. So, I mean, it's a seven year old wine. And it, it was probably harvested in March, so fermented. Um, so, yeah, we're talking a seven year old wine in the bottle. Well, maybe not in the bottle, but it started aging seven years ago. Um, it's got a bit of a brick quality to it, and there is sediment, which means it probably was unfiltered. Um, it's got a bit of a brick quality, so there might be some oxi oxidation to it, but it tastes pretty good. I mean, if you find this wine somewhere, the 2005 specifically, but I would say if you find any other of the Dulhoff wines, it might be pretty uh, interesting to check out. 88. Um, I like it a decent amount, um, but because, and, and honestly, the reason why I give it an 88 and not an 89 or a 90 is, the, and it, again, it may not be the winemaker uh, fault, but somewhere along the line, it may have been exposed to too much heat and there may have been some heat damage to it, but it's still a good, I mean, it's still worth, 30, I mean, it's still worth the money to me. It tastes pretty good. I'd get it. Really like it a lot. And, and the 88 is only because uh, I, I think there might be some heat damage to it, but I think it actually may have, or maybe maybe uh, the the wine is aged a little bit faster than than it should have, um, and that might be it may have uh, not be where it should be. But then again, I kind of like it. I don't know, 88. I'll stick with that. All right, so uh, we're going to move on to the next segment. Now this is a going to be a pretty long segment. Uh, it's going to be about wine faults. So uh, get your propeller hat, propeller hat on. We're not going to go too much into all the scientific stuff about it because um, that thing just made my head spin a little bit. But we're going to get a little bit into that, into what wine faults are. And uh, not every single fault, but almost all of them we're going to go through. And uh, we'll save your wine after the break here. 
All right, now we're back and we're going to do on this, this um, segment of Wine 101, we're going to go over wine faults. All right, so first of all, what are wine faults? Well, there's a difference between fault and a flaw. Basically, a fault is something that's really pretty major in the wine, something that's going to make it effectively undrinkable. Um, whereas a flaw doesn't mean that you can't drink it, but it probably is it's affected the wine enough to, to make it not as good as it should be. Um, these are unpleasant characteristics, so it could be something that smells bad, tastes bad, um, you know, or, or, or actually visual. It could be a visual thing, it could be a, an olfactory thing, or it could be, um, I don't know, an oral thing, I don't know, a taste, a taste thing. Um, it also is an indication of poor winemaking or storage or both. Um, Almost all these faults and flaws are actually naturally present and they're just at a very low threshold. Humans have uh, amazingly low thresholds of, or being able to detect very small amounts of, of chemicals, of things, okay? Um, when you start looking at these things, some of these things are parts per billion or parts per trillion that you're detecting through your nose or through, or through taste. And it's pretty amazing that we detect such small quantities. And there's not much room for error. So you, you'll sit there and have a wine that doesn't have very much of, of a certain type of fault or a flaw or, or, or characteristic, and all of a sudden it's bad wine. Um, and like I said, some people, and we have, we have a very low sensitivity, or we have a very high sensitivity of it, but some people are even more sensitive to some of these faults and flaws. Something that I may not think is a faulted wine or a flawed wine, somebody else may, may find it's just undrinkable. Um, but it's, it's a, it definitely there's a personal uh, preference or difference to that. All right, let's go through the list of faults real quick, uh, or the types of faults. You have oxidation, sulfur, environmental, microbiological, re-fermentation, and then I just kind of did a generic other. And we're going to go through each of these uh, types of faults. All right, so first we're going to cover oxidation. All right, the first one we're going to talk about is acetaldehyde. You know, I thought I had that pronunciation down pretty good last night. Um, when you have high levels of this, you get a sherry type of character. And, and when it's a sherry wine or, or a wine that's purposefully oxidized, those types of flavors and aromas are expected. If it's a wine that's, you know, just some California cab, and you get oxida oxidation, oxidation. Um, then it's it's a fault or a flaw. It's not intended to be that way. But if you're drinking a sherry, it's intended. Um, when it's in really high high levels, you'll get things like green apple. It'll taste a bit sour, um, or you'll get that metallic flavor to it. Acetic acid, VA or volatile acidity. Um, that's what's also known as vinegar taint. So that's what. Um, that's what you get. They get that vinegar type of flavor to it. Um, it's really kind of nasty. It's a wine spoilage yeast uh, or yeast that cause wine spoilage. So this is an indication that the wine is spoiled or is spoiling. Um, when you have low levels of VA, it's considered a complexity. Okay. So again, these are things that are naturally occurring. You're going to have this in the wine, but I mean, too much of it. You know, the whole too much of, too much of anything is a bad thing. Too much of it makes the wine undrinkable, it tastes like vinegar, uh, smells like vinegar, and it's unpleasant. Uh, ethyl acetate, acetate. Um, this is, uh, in, in low levels, you're going to get um, riches and sweetness, but this is uh, the same, um, same chemical as in nail polish remover. So when you have high levels of it, uh, and some people find that it's, you know, if it's high enough that you can kind of detect or you smell nail polish remover, some people are kind of like, well, I kind of like it. I'm kind of on the fence of that one. Normally, I'm not really a big fan of that. But you'll get the nail polish remover, glue, or varnish. So this is, again, the same type of chemical compound that you find in these other products um, and that if you have too much of it, you're going to get that type of um, uh, aromas. Sulfur. Now, this is one of those things where sulfur is in wine. First of all, it kind of naturally occurs, but winemakers will add sulfur to the wine uh, or to the, during the winemaking process. Um, 
it's, it's very common. It's used to prevent oxidation and also to prevent, uh, to stop fermentation. Now, sulfur dioxide is specifically what they add to the wine. That's why I have the C above, all right? That's, that's what they're using to stop fermentation um, or to prevent oxidation. Um, but if you have too much SO2, you're gonna get that matchstick uh, smell, burnt rubber, or mothballs. So it's like, like if you, if you, if you lit, lit a match and you get that sulfurous uh, smell to it, that too much SO2. Hydrogen sulfide, H2S. Now all of us remember chemistry in our high school, <laughs> if you took it, uh, and that rotten egg smell, that's what H2S is. Again, this is something that happens during the fermentation process. Um, and then if, if the yeasts, if the yeasts are producing too much H2S, uh, you get some pretty nasty rotten egg smell. Uh, mercaptans, uh, also known as thiols. Um, this is something where, um, one, it's all, it can be part of um, the process of creating H2S, but um, it has also kind of the prolonged contact with the lees. Now remember, lees are the dead yeast cells. Um, so if you're having a wine that you age on, the, on lees or sur lee, you have to do what's called racking or you have to stir the lees up so that you don't have the, so you don't have the wine. Well, your racking is where you move one wine from one barrel to another and it's, part, it's kind of a filtration process a little bit. It's kind of like decanting, not really a filtration. But if you leave if you leave some wine on the lees too long, it can create this uh, it can create this onion or rubber or skunk type of uh, aroma. Uh, dimethyl sulfide (DMS) this is naturally occurring. Uh, it just happens to happen you know during during the whole process of winemaking. When it's in low levels, you'll get a fruitiness or a fullness or adds complexity. You're going to see complexity a few more times. Um, so low levels of these flaws or faults, it's complexity. High levels, now you're gonna get that cooked cabbage, um, which I personally am not a fan of. Occasionally it's all right, like you get corned beef and cabbage type of thing. Canned corn, asparagus. Asparagus is one of those flavors or aromas that, that's, that's not something you really want in, in a wine. And asparagus is also one of those wine, or foods that's very difficult to pair with wine because of the flavor with it. And truffles, all right. Environmental factors, all right, cork taint. All right, now this is very big. First of all, it's called TCA or, and I, I worked on this pronunciation, 246 trichloranosol, trichloranosol. It looks like a massive word or a really hard word, but it's really trichloranosol or sol, all right? And I also learned how to, what the two, four, and six mean now. Um, I didn't pay attention, I guess, in chemistry in high school about what that meant, but I do now. All right, so cork taint isn't smelling the cork. It is not necessarily the cork itself. It is poor chlorine sterilization of corks, um, but uh, it's not. you're not gonna smell cork taint from the cork. Now, you will have some people sit there and say, well, I smell the cork, so I can see if there's anything wrong with the wine. The, the, I'm, I'm in the, this camp of the majority opinion is that you can't smell anything other than cork from the cork. All right. Um, and this is actually, this whole cork tank thing and smelling cork, because I saw somebody talking about, oh, I smelled the cork, or I was talking about smelling the cork is a, mark, is a sign of an amateur wine drinker. Um, that's how this whole wine fault thing started, because I figured if I'm going to do cork taint, I might as well do all the faults. All right, so you get the moldy newspaper, wet leaves, or the wet dog. Get a cardboard type of thing. Wet, wet cardboard is another, another aspect. Heat. All right, so the ideal storage temperature of wine is 55 degrees Fahrenheit. I forgot what it is in Celsius, like 30 degrees Celsius, Celsius or something like that. Um, now, so you, so you must assume that I have a nice wine cave or I've got wine refrigerators, whatever. No, I got a rack over here. Actually, it's right, in, right behind the big work lights, though luckily the lights, the heat isn't too bad behind the light. Um, just in front of the lights, it's hot. But um, you know, I have a wine rack that's next to, next to a window, but the house is kept pretty cool. I mean, the house is usually 70 to 72 degrees, especially in this part of the house. 
um, but it's not quote the ideal temperature to store wine. Uh, you do want to store it in as, as cool a place as possible with with the lowest amount of sunlight. There's no direct sunlight that hits hits the wine, um, but uh, if you're going to store wine for long periods of time, more than say a year or two, then you're going to want to get something either you have a wine fridge or you have a nice really cold dark night uh, decently humid part of a house um, or you have a wine cellar actually type of thing you have a wine room that's you know had very temperature and humidity controlled um, that's if you want to store wine long term so if I'm going to get some really uber expensive wines and I'm going to keep them for three four five ten years that's what you want to do with wine all right what happens? Well, even storing wine at, quote, modern room temperature, which is 70 some odd degrees, um, which room temperature back in the day was closer to like 60 something. Um, but if you uh, store your wine in not so great conditions, it increases the aging rate. Um, and, you, and it may push the cork up. And it may have, like this cork we mentioned in that last wine, some staining along the sides of the cork. Now, this in and of itself isn't necessarily an indicator or, or proves heat damage, but it can give you cause for concern. When I drank that wine, I was a little concerned. When I, when I opened up the bottle and I was looking at the cork, I was a little bit concerned that I might have some heat damage, but it tasted fine. So, But again, it also may have aged, if, if it had been stored or that one particular point where it was stored and it was a little too hot, um, it may have uh, aged a little bit too fast. Light strike, never heard of this until I started doing the research. All right, so light strike is uh, when UV light hits the, hits the wine. Now, for all you beer drinkers out there, you probably know about that. You don't store beer in clear bottles, unless you're Corona. Um, you know, you have green and brown bottles, and you, matter of fact, Sam Adams, you know, they have famous commercials, right? And one of the commercials is talking about the type of bottles, the color of the glass, because brown, blocks the most amount of light and light can damage alcohol all right well at least beer and wine it can damage um, so that's why you have colored glass bottles light strike really affects champagne or delicate white wines more than anything else a red wine isn't going to be affected as much by by uv light but white wines and sparkling wines like champagne can again why they have colored glass bottles um, if you get light strike, you may get a wet cardboard or a wet wool type of uh, smell to it. Ladybird taint, another one I've never heard of before. So um, remember, this is a crop, right? And there's all sorts of things flying out there in, in a vineyard. Well, you have things like ladybirds or la ladybugs, all right? Um, not ladybugs, but ladybird. And there's like lady, little insects, okay? And some of these insects, they get caught up in the whole um, harvesting process and when it comes time to maybe crush the grapes or they're destemming it these bugs may release certain compounds that are effectively defense mechanisms so that the predators don't eat them right because it tastes bad well it gets into the wine or it can get into the wine now at low levels if you have a couple bugs here and there it's not going to really affect anything but if you have enough of it if it's a high enough level and I think this is one of those that's very very that doesn't take very much for for us to detect it You'll get things like rancid peanut butter, bitter herbaceousness, green bell pepper. I'm like, what? And cat urine. Like, what? All right. So let's go over to a couple things. Green bell pepper. That's something that's very uh, much a Cabernet Franc uh, indicator. That's not, a, that's not a fault or a flaw when you're dealing with Cabernet Franc. But if you're dealing with, say, something like Chardonnay, yeah, it's probably... Um, it might be a fault or a flaw, or you're dealing with, you know, I don't know, let's pick some other grape that usually doesn't have green bell pepper, Pinot, Pinot Noir, maybe not, you know, something like that. Cat urine. Well, we all know about the cat's pee, you know, and the Sauvignon Blanc. That's like kind of a typical thing, but you probably shouldn't have any cat urine in Riesling, okay? So um, again, it's, some of these things are dependent on the grape. Some of it is supposed to be there because the grape has those, when you ferment, it has those qualities. All right, microbiological. All right, the first one we're gonna hit is Brettanomyces. Brettanomyces, sorry, not Brettanomyces. It's also known as Brett, because it's just easier to pronounce. 
this is a yeast, okay? It's present, it's naturally occurring, but it's one of those things where if it shows up in a, in, in a winery, it's very difficult to get rid of. Um, and wineries spend a lot of time and money and effort to try to prevent any Brett from really entering uh, the winery because it can really, it can really affect the, the taste of the wine. Um, it happens in, in reds more than anything else. Um, fault or not? Well, like I said, someone's fault is another one's, or flaw is somebody else's complexity. Um, I happen to like a little bit of Brett in my wine. However, I don't want a whole lot of it. Um, so you'll get that barnyard, you'll get wet dog and sweaty saddle. Just like somebody else wrote, I've never smelled a sweaty saddle, never tasted a wetty sa sweaty saddle, and I'm not looking forward to trying it, but you know, that kind of leather just you know, has the combination of sweat and leather, okay? Um, and you'll especially find this in some of your older world wines to pull, add complexity to it, especially your Pinot Noirs, that type of stuff. All right, lactic acid bacteria. All right, so you have quite a few things that lack the lactic acid when you go through the malolactic fermentation, um, or whether you do or not. These are things that can, can create or be caused by the lactic acid. Uh, you have a bitterness taint, um, so just the wine is just bitter. Uh, diacetyl, um, diacetyl, sorry, diacetyl, not diacetyl. Diacetyl. Uh, at low levels, you get a nuttiness or a caramel to it. I had a wine at Max's Wine Dive during our tweet up on last Thursday. Um, it was, uh, now I can't remember the name, it was Turtle, Tortoise, Tortoise Creek Carmenere. Um, no, Carignan, Carignan. Man, caramel for days. Technically, it's probably a flaw or a fault, but it was really nice. Um, you know, it's low levels. At high levels, you get an intense buttery or butterscotch flavor or aroma. I didn't get any butterscotch or it wasn't intensely buttery, but I was getting that caramel. Uh, germanium taint. Another thing about the whole chemical process, what's going on. I, I'm a horrible with flowers, so if I ever detected this, I might just think it's unpleasant, but I wouldn't necessarily know it's germanium. Manitol. Okay, these are things I've never heard of. Manitol as a viscous ester-like, it's viscous and ester-like with sweet, or the wine is viscous, ester-like with a sweet and irritating finish. That's how it's described. I never had a wine like that. Now, viscosity, that's something we do talk about with wines. Um, and someone talked about, well, what does viscosity tell you about the wine? In general, it tells you nothing other than uh, potentially can give you a, a, an idea of the alcohol content. Um, but reading this, um, if the wine is maybe too viscous for what it's supposed to be, that might be an indicator that there's a flaw or a fault. Ropiness. This is uh, called a slimy or fatty mouthfeel. So I guess you know, this is more of a feel rather than a, a smell or a taste. Mousiness. Now, this one's kind of a little, you know, ugh. But um, again, this is something that you can only detect from tasting it because um, our saliva has is more alkaline than acidic. Um, and when you combine it with the chemicals or with, with, with the chemical that causes this mousiness, you'll get what's called mouse cage or mouse urine. I know, not exactly pleasant stuff. All right, other. Oh, I went a little bit farther than I thought. I thought I was doing great on time. I caught ahead and now I'm behind a lot. All right, other, re-fermentation. That's uh, bubbles that shouldn't be there. Sparkling wine or frizzante wine or, semi or slightly sparkling, you know, um, they are supposed to have it. They go through a second fermentation or, the, or get CO2 injected into the bottle, give it a little bit of fizz. But a red wine in general or a still white wine shouldn't have fermentation, shouldn't have a second fermentation. So that meant something happened in the wine that gave it an extra bit of CO2. So that is a fault or a flaw. Um, cloudy or haziness. Now, this is not typically a fault um, because some wines go unfiltered. Um, but if it's, uh, if it's very, very, very cloudy, like not you know more than you would consider an unfiltered wine, then there might have been something that there might have been some yeast that spoiled the wine. Sediment, again, not necessarily a fault, 
Um, it's it's considered natural. It's when the tannins polymerize, so they 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 become they they get solid or they get solidified in the wine. Um, this is a lot of reasons why, especially with New World wines, winemakers filter their wine because Americans, especially Americans, uh, find that sediment is just nasty. They don't like it. Um, so if you have sediment, you just pour it very carefully uh, or you use a decanter so you can kind of see, you see the sediment a little bit better and you let it fall down to the bottom of the uh, bottle or the decanter. So when you have, you know, you're supposed to store your bottle, you know, all horizontal, but if you notice an old bottle, you know it has sediment, especially if you can kind of see into it, let the bottle sit for a little bit so that all the sediment will fall to the bottom of the bottle. Or you can use the decanter too, it helps keep that sediment in there. Uh, tartaric crystals. All right, so tartaric acid is a natural part of wine. It happens a lot in, in it's just it's part of the whole wine process. Um, it's the acid that's in there. Uh, winemakers use cold stabilization to help uh, prevent these little crystals from forming. The problem is these, especially when you're dealing with white wine, because it's really easily seen in the wine, you get these crystals and people will freak out and they think that you know there's something wrong with the bottle, that there's shards of glass in the wine, when there really isn't. Um, if you Usually you'll see this, with, especially with white wine, you've stored it kind of cold or cool. If you let the wine warm up a little bit, uh, typically the, the, the crystals will dissolve um, or they'll at least, hopefully they'll, they'll go down to the bottom of the, of the uh, bottle. Now I've had some wine that just the crystals are just so bad that I'm like, I felt it was unservable. So I've sent them back to the distributor to get, to get a replacement wine. Um, but very likely there's something wrong with the, the wine either didn't go through cold stabilization or it didn't take. So there was an issue with the wine. It's perfectly drinkable. It's perfectly fine. It's not going to affect anything as far as the aroma or the taste. Um, but you may get those little the crystals and you may feel, feel kind of funny in your mouth. Um, and that's it for all the wine faults and flaws. So, as you can see, there's lots of things that can affect the wine. Sometimes it's not a fault or a, or a flaw in the wine. It's sometimes just that the wine just tastes bad. Um, but poor winemaking can create some of these issues and create some of these float flavors, aromas, mouthfeels. Um, but sometimes just the wine just wasn't made right. It's not a faulted or flawed wine technically. It just doesn't taste good. It, it just, it was unbalanced. There was too much of one thing or the other, um, but it's not necessarily a fault or a flaw. All right, hopefully uh, this didn't bore you too much. Went really kind of long on this, so I was trying to get through the other wines kind of quick. Um, next week, I plan to do something more about, and it may be just as long, maybe as long as this too, go through uh, the kind of the life of a wine vine. All right, that's going to do it. Thank you for stopping by. As always, uh, friend me up above. Uh, click the links below for uh, the winery. Well, the one winery doesn't have a link to click, but for uh, Dulhof, uh, Sessie's Wine Shop, um, and hit the donate button to the side, send a couple ducats, and we'll see everyone again next time.